some people on now. This is great. All right. I'll wait to pull up the slides until just a few more people come on. Perfect. Welcome those of you who are on to the Texas Smart City series. Uh, very happy to have a colleague and friend of ours presenting today on something really cool that we hope to be, we can get deployed in Austin at some point in the near future. It's been deployed in other places, so it's been proven. Uh, excited to show it to everybody today. And I would like to say that because Yulia is here, we can say our global audience for the Texas Smart City series. <laughs> That's right. Yulia, are you connecting from Poland right now? I know you can't speak from where you are, but you can answer in chat. I think that's a yes. Thumbs yeah. up. All right, there we go. So it's a truly global audience today. Let's see, it's 12.01, so I'm going to wait for another second or two. Hi, Eric, how are you doing? Ed and lots of good people. Iris. Ajay, all our, all our friends, Brad, all our friends are here. Tina's here. Haribel, new names I don't recognize as well. So Haribel, good to see, good to meet you. Carl, hello. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, and include your LinkedIn, what you're working on, uh, what you're interested in. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, Jay. Neither of you. I really should just have this all ready to pay, shouldn't I? There we go. All right, it's 12.02, so I'm gonna bring up the initial slides. We know people will be connecting for the first few minutes of this, so we expect the audience to grow, but it's okay if we start with the first few slides that won't cut into Steve Steinberg's presentation. So let me pull up this. Okay, are you all able to see the screen? And Is it in presentation mode for you? Yep, yep, yep. Awesome, yep. great. So I wanna welcome everybody to the Texas Smart City series. Uh, I'm Jay Boisseau. I'm the founder and executive director of the Austin Smart City Alliance. In that capacity, formerly Austin City Up, in that capacity, we have made uh, some relationships with some of our colleagues from other cities in Texas. And we've held two conferences, one in person and one online during the pandemic, the Texas Smart City Summits. We decided that it was useful to continue to have interaction as a state uh, between these summits. And so we started the Texas Smart City series as a way to showcase expertise in smart cities that all of our cities should consider integrating into their activities. So this is a twice monthly series. We'll probably move to monthly in the summer, um, but it is a chance for us to bring national, global, and as well as local experts into this. We use this online lunch and learn format, at least it's lunchtime for folks that are in the central time zone. Uh, and we do it on the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. The speakers could be any kind of expert, could be government leaders, could be industry experts, could be researchers. So we want to keep the series open to whoever has something to say and share that can help elevate all of our smart cities efforts. We have a couple more uh, programmed after this, and of course, we'll keep programming them out on April 28th. Asaf Francis, the Director of Urban Policy and Partnerships for Zen City, will speak on resident-centered smart cities, actionable insights on resident sentiment around the reopening of Texas. And then on May 12th, Jennifer Sanders, one of our uh, program leads for the Texas Smart Cities events, uh, she will speak on moving from smart cities to smart regions and beyond. So re really excited about those two talks coming up. But today, very excited to have Steve Steinberg of IOLAP on uh, presenting today. Um, this is a partnership long in the making. We're really excited about the, the possibilities here. I don't want to steal too much of Steve's thunder, but 
I just want to say that I think this is the coolest and most useful of the potential projects we've uncovered over the last four years, um, because it would be in, the, the outreach for it would be incredible. It can use natural language interfaces, which is the one way that everybody knows how to communicate is with human language. And this uses AI to allow people to communicate the way they like to communicate in order to get them the information they want. I won't say any more than that. At this point, I will turn it over to Steve. Steve, thanks for joining us today. We can't hear you, Steve. You got a hard one. Oh, how are you guys doing? Uh, nice to meet everyone. Thanks, Jay, for uh, inviting us here to present. Um, look forward to hopefully chatting with each of you and, and Please, if you have questions, just throw them in the, the chat at any time and we'll try to address either as we go or, or at the end. Um, like Jay said, my name is Steve Steinberg. Uh, I'm the CEO of Responsum. Responsum is a, um, a product that was incubated by a company called IOLAP, which is a data and analytics um, uh, consultancy that uh, prides itself on innovation. Um, so I'm going to talk through some things here around uh, some AI and big data initiatives and how we are applying those to um, civic engagement, um, improving efficiency, uh, and building resilience. So can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll sort of start this out with kind of setting the stage here. So unexpected events are coming up all the time. It seems recently we've got hurricanes, we have the snowpocalypse in Austin, uh, COVID. There are lots of things that need to be reacted to quickly and easily to try to get the information to the public. Um, and from different departments throughout all sorts of government uh, organizations, the data and the systems are varied. Um, and so there's not, there's not a lot of consistency um, and, and there's a lot of siloed work going on um, that tends to make it difficult to access all of this important information and to impart that information you know, on the public. So just an example of one of the uh, initiatives that we launched here, um, we worked with Houston Airport System um, to help make their data more accessible. So by bringing together um, real-time data in um, a data pipeline from all sorts of different disparate data sources, um, building a data lake and then building dashboards and, and, uh, and KPIs on top of that, streamlining their passenger experience by, by having real-time information and being able to take action on that quickly and um, allowing us to implement new technology on top of that uh, you know, fast as well. So this kind of set the stage for and the, the product and the architecture that I'm gonna talk about here next. The way that this worked is, is all um, cloud-based architecture, drawing in different systems, build, building up uh, you know, from things as it relates to security in the airport or uh, the cleanliness of the bathrooms or um, real-time flight data, um, all of this information drawn in together to be able to, to action and report on it. So, but then the question become, becomes, you know, what if we don't have resources for a larger project like that to really bring in all that data into one space? And so, being data experts and in this industry for 20 plus years, um, you know, we wanted to find an easier way to be able to allow um, uh, this information to be accessed and, and also for it to be dispersed out to where it needs to go. So what we have done here is we have a product called Responsum, which is a conversational AI assistant that allows you to use natural language and speak directly to the systems and data where they live now. So while it's not required to have an amazing, you know, uh, organized uh, data lake and, and all of the reporting that goes around that, certainly that's a good thing as well. Um, but Responsum is able to take information 
um, and impart that upon uh, internal employees as well as citizens um, without that being the case. Uh, so what we're able to do is through a conversational assistant, um, you are able to talk through either voice or chat. Um, you can interact with the system through uh, a browser-based uh, bot that looks like a chat bot, uh, through a mobile app, uh, integrated into a mobile app that you might already have, um, as well as integrated into Slack and Teams. So you'd be able to um, you know, interact with this assistant through your collaboration tool that you're using on a daily basis. And the history of, of that conversation um, you know, would remain in that tool, just like any of your other conversations you have. So the, the sort of next step that we did at Houston, which is a, a demo I'm gonna show you now, um, is was around actually taking that data and using it to allow real-time access to performance insights um, and reducing airport support costs. Um, enhancing the traveler experience. So one of the big things in the um, in the airport world in particular is there's a something called the Skytrax rating that rates the airports on how well they are um, handling travelers and all sorts of operational metrics. Um, and so they wanted to bring this type of uh, communication to their travelers to try to enhance that rating, which actually ended up occurring. And um, Houston is one of the highest rated uh, airports in the country um, and also help drive revenue. So drive people to revenue generating services within, within the airport. So what we deployed was a, a website chatbot, mobile bot, and uh, COVID related questions as well uh, into an assistant that is a trained uh, AI model that understands um, the airport industry and the types of questions that people ask and consistently learns and becomes smarter as more people interact. So I'll do a demo of this one real quick here, give you an idea of how this works. So this is the Fly to Houston um, website. This is their, the, the, the website for Houston Airport. And you'll see there's an assistant on this site that allows them to um, it allows travelers to come and interact. So the first, because they have two airports, two core airports, the first thing it does is ask you which airport you want. So after that, you're able to um, use some of the smart bubbles here that can help guide you through, um, you know, some frequently uh, asked questions, um, or you can just start typing, um, and you're going to start to get suggestions. Um, in this, in this response. So uh, where can my dog go to the bathroom? If I just ask a question that I didn't select from that, uh, that list that popped up, I am going to, you're gonna see here that when I ask something like, where can my dog go to the bathroom? I end up getting the service animal relief areas in the airport, which is, because this is a natural language model that understands the way humans talk and it understands that dogs going to the bathroom is the same thing as service animal you know, relief areas in the context of the airport. Um, and so if I want to find my Uber or Lyft driver, I'm, I can quickly get to answers and quickly see things that might be relevant. Um, where can I catch a taxi? you know, things like that. Um, and so the airport is controlling the content uh, that is uh, housed here. And it's a very simple um, interface that allows them to uh, update this content when necessary, um, tra help train, uh, help train as well. So I'm gonna, I'll show you, um, I'll show you that real quick here. So the way that that content is managed, and this will this will sort of lead us down the path for how a city would work as well, is that 
there is an interface where you're able to input the questions and answers to these frequently asked questions. Now, this is like very rudimentary way that, that our system works. We can connect to any API, any database, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But just for the sake of, of information like you would want to get in an airport or in a city, you know, um, that is more around just textual answers on content like this, you're able to control this um, through an interface like this. You're able to set up the uh, service animals are welcome the at the airport. As service well. animal relief areas can be found. And you can listen to that. And so when you submit a, a um, an update, to a question or you submit a brand new question and answer that you want to be stored within the system. We have two tiers of, of administration. And this was really important as, as Jay and others were talking about, you know, how would we let a city be able to control their content, but also have some sort of editor that would be able to review and make sure that the information is accurate and sounds, um, sounds good and everything. So what we do is once you submit a change, um, we can give access to every department to be able to submit new questions or submit potential edits to existing content. And then only certain editors would be allowed to get to the questions waiting to be reviewed, where they would go in and look at what someone has added or updated and accept or reject that question. Um, and so it's a very you know, simple way to add, edit, delete content that is available within the assistant. And as soon as um, it's accepted, um, we have an automated data pipeline that will retrain the model uh, to handle um, any new content that, that arises. So that is the, the flow of the way that, uh, that we control this sort of what we're calling the, the FAQ knowledge base library. Um, back here, uh, so then, so this is the, the public facing assistant that helps us with traveler engagement. The other thing that Houston has done is deploy internally an assistant that they can use to get internal metrics. Um, and this can actually be deployed, like I said, in Teams or in Slack. Um, this interface I'm gonna show you here is just our portal where we're not storing any, any information from prior, but in Teams and Slack, that wouldn't be the case. So um, I can use text or voice here or these smart bubbles. So I could do things like, um, uh, like uh, security, TSA wait time, and select these bubbles. It's going to ask me for which checkpoint. And I say Houston, and it says the current wait time for hobby is 12 minutes. So that's real time data coming directly from uh, the data warehouse. So we have a, a natural language layer that understands what the user desires to, to achieve. And if we have a follow-up question, we ask the follow-up question. If we want to engage in multi-tier dialogue, we could do that as well. Um, and then ultimately, we're, we, if we've collected all the information that we need, we end up going to the system um, where that answer lies and, and getting, that, getting that data. So I can do things like, I'll show you an example. I think I have my sound shared here. Yep. So, do an example here with uh, with voice. I could say, how many departing flights were completed in the last two weeks? For which airport? IAH. Between March 31st, 2021 and April 14th, 2021. 6,639 departure flights have been completed at IAH. What would you like to know next? And for HOU? Between March 31, 2021 and April 14, 2021, 
2,152 departure flights have been completed at HOU. You can ask me your next question. So you can see here that same thing, I'm using voice. It's able to interpret in the same way. It understands, you know, um, date ranges and um, natural language, the way you would ask things and retrieves answers from, from the database. Um, this, when I said, uh, when I said N for HOU, you can see that it understands context. So it knows that I'm asking the same question and now I just wanna know the same answer, but for a different airport. So all of this dialogue is, is pre-trained and that's really the way that our, that our models work. They're, once they're trained on a specific particular discipline, um, we're able to then deploy that similar model out to other organizations that might be able to benefit from it. So, um, uh, so other than that here, uh, let's move back to... If we have any questions, okay. Um, back to the deck here. So the other demo that I'm gonna show you today is related to a city assistant. So we have deployed in Prosper, Texas, um, a city assistant that has the similar type of interface where citizens are able to ask questions they really focused a lot on COVID initially, and they're now adding um, other information from other departments. Um, but the goal is to make it, it, is to reduce the reliance on city employees to have to answer the same questions over and over again, um, and to get people answers more quickly as, as it's difficult to find information about every department in the city, given, given the way that it's structured. So, um, same thing here, uh, FAQs, chatbot, uh, COVID data set. In this case, we actually have a COVID data set coming from the CDC. So supplementing the information that is provided by Prosper themselves. Uh, you can also just ask any sort of COVID related question. And if the CDC and FEMA and, and uh, has, has also, or has included content around that, then that has been trained into the model as well. Um, what I'm gonna show you here is, this is a, a site where um, we have a 311 model deployed. So just like with the, with the airport, you can see that there are um, you know, smart bubbles that can help you um, get people quickly to, to questions that they might have. And the management of these bubbles is extremely simple. Um, there's another interface within the portal that the admin would be able to control where they could set up the hierarchy of how they want these bubbles to work and what they should do when you click them. And it's, it's extremely simple to manage. Um, in terms of the dialogue here, you know, I'm able to do the same thing and I'm, I'm starting to get information from different departments. So you can imagine the, the, the fire department being able to control their content with an overriding editor that would make sure that they correspond with them and make sure everything's accurate before it gets pushed live into the, into the production product. And so I can click on any of these or I can ask questions just like I did in the other, the other assistant. But the other key to this city assistant that extends the, the logic beyond just frequently asked questions is that we can index thousands of documents um, and when the user when the when the citizen searches the answer might be on page seven of some 50 page uh, document that talks about how to get a certain permit or, or whatever and so the the ability to include, um, knowledge management into the assistant is something that we support and it's trained on those documents. We actually worked with NASA and we trained um, the assistant to handle 17,000 research papers around space radiation. And the scientists were able to search those papers and retrieve research um, that would otherwise have taken them hours to find um, 
and and then the, and then use that information to collaborate with the authors of those papers to try to push push their research forward. So, knowledge management is is a part of this as well as three one one. So if I say my neighbor's yard is a mess, <laughs> and I want him to mow it more. So how do I report him? So basically, you just type any sort of natural language phrase in here. And we have trained the model to understand, based on hundreds of thousands of 311 requests that have come in to cities previously, um, we have trained it to understand that this is actually a request related to mowing and high weeds in a neighborhood. And so we're asking the person if they want to submit a 311 request. And so if they say yes, um, we say, sure, let's collect a little bit more info, provide a location for the issue. Because this model is trained um, for Prosper, um, you have to provide a, a an address that is within the jurisdiction of Prosper or it won't, uh, it won't let you set, submit a 311 request that's outside of their jurisdiction. Um, so once I select a location, I'm able to then um, provide a, maybe a larger description of the issue and say, um, you know, he never mowed his yard and the weeds are fading. Whatever, um, I can upload photos so I can attach a photo, video, audio file um, by just selecting, here's a picture of uh, unmowed lawn. Um, I say done. And now I want to complete my request. Hi. So when I say complete my request, it says, thanks for keeping us informed of issues in our community. Would you like to provide your email address so we can track your request? So we can either say yes and provide it, and it will associate it with our 311 account. Um, if we previously have one um, within Prosper, they actually you know, let you create an account and you can check the tracking of your issues later, or you could submit it anonymously. So if Hello. I say yes, um, I am able to uh, provide my email address here. And it's going to give me a summary. Thanks for keeping us informed of issues in our community. Here's a summary of the request. And what that does at that point is call an API and actually submits that ticket into Prosper's 311 system in this case. But any, any 311 system um, can be supported as long as there is some sort of API or database connectivity for us to um, to utilize. We can also support, you know, in certain circumstances, maybe you submit um, a, a specific issue that requires some other follow-up questions. It, the, the dialogue can be dynamic and it can ask different follow-up questions based on different types of requests, or it can, and it can handle changes in the conversation. So I could say, there's a dead squirrel in the street and it's Really disgusting. So now it says, based on your request, sounds like you want to submit a request related to dead animal. Well, what if I were? What if I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. So I say no, and it's it's asking me is is it the wrong category, or and maybe you do want to submit a request, or it's not really a three one one request. So if I say it's not a request. What it's going to do is it's going to try to find content that might be relevant, um, you know, from the knowledge base if there was anything. In this case, there really wasn't anything that great. But um, the point is that you know all this information is accessible from an assistant that can be deployed on the web, can be deployed um, in a mobile app, and through Slacker Teams, or frankly other other means as well. Um, that's just where we have focused the most at this point. So um, with that, let's hop back here. 
So the key benefits of this are to serve more residents. It's always on 24 seven, providing answers to people that need them quickly. Um, it uses voice and text. So uh, it increases the ability for um, access from all citizens, whether they have a disability hey, or not. Um, and uh, you're able to answer questions faster. You're also able to learn what people want. That, that's really key. So um, one thing I'll show here in, in, in that regard is, um, let's see. So through our training, there's multiple ways to train. I'm not gonna show all this right now, but through our um, training methodology, you're able to see what, what is asked and what is answered in terms of, you know, I said, where can my dog go to the bathroom? It, it responded with where are the service animal relief areas. And you're able to train it to understand, yep, that's right, or no, that's not right. And maybe if there is content in the system, you can click select a better answer, choose what it should be. And from doing things like that, along with just user feedback that occurs with the thumbs up, thumbs down um, on the actual assistant, our model is just continuously trained to become smarter. And so um, the more user interactions we get, the more it's gonna understand maybe some weird ways people might ask something um, that isn't already known in, in sort of the natural language world. So it's, it's, it's understanding, um, you know, industry type specific information. And so this training model module allows you to, to go through and review everything that's being asked, then easily add new content um, or reach out to the department that, that you need to, to, uh, to get them to, to help with that information. Um, and so th there's a lot more to the training than that. So I'd be happy to, to walk you through that uh, if, if you're interested. So just definitely reach out to me. Um, but in terms of how it works, so we have the knowledge base that can pull in FAQs or documents that, is then, that are then trained to be able to pull natural language searches. We integrate to any API. Um, so um, we can, we can um, call data from any sort of system. You don't have to at first spend millions of dollars to create uh, an organized data warehouse. Um, if, if, if the data is accessible at all, then we can get to it. Um, and then the natural language model is already trained on, on millions of interactions when it, as it pertains to airport as well as uh, city related 311 content. Um, so the platform, just to summarize here, you use plain language, voice or text. You use that through a mobile app, you use it through the website. Responsum's engine here in the middle is where all of the training has taken place and continues to become smarter. So our AI team um, is helping out uh, every client to be able to uh, ensure that their model uh, is continuously getting updated and um, and providing guidance on ways that it can be enhanced. Uh, so once we understand the, the user's request, we're able to then go to the requisite system where that answer might be um, and retrieve the information and send it back to the back to the user. Um, I'm somebody saying my screen stopped sharing. Is that is? Can you guys see my screen? Uh, it's not sharing. It's not sharing right now. Oh well, that's not cool. Um, how about now? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> this uh, most of that stuff was just text, so it's fine. So that yeah, this was the diagram that. Uh, um, allows you to see how the users are interacting with the system, the engine in the middle that's, that's really the magic of understanding what's going on and determining which system to go to, um, whether it's a database or an API or just a knowledge base or a, or a swath of documents that the answer might reside in. 
So the other key here that, that I discussed was about operations. So there's the citizen engagement, civic engagement, and then there's the internal operations part of it, which I showed you with Houston, you know, asking different questions that are related to KPIs and things that the, the, the employees actually care about. So, you know, at the airport in particular, you know, there's these type of questions that they're, that they're always wanting to know as they're going throughout their day, average taxi times and flight statuses and wait times and things of that nature. Um, in the city, in every department, there is this, there are, you know, probably a few dozen uh, items that are wanted that, that, that would be desired to be able to be accessible real time uh, on a daily basis. And that's the type of information that we can build um, with, with this platform. So the more interactions by travelers, by citizens, the library grows, the smarter the AI becomes, and you're getting insights throughout that process to learn um, what people are actually thinking as they're interacting, interacting with the city and not just have historical um, records that are never looked at. Uh, so one other thing to mention here that, that we do is that we can actually look at historical records. So we can look at the history of all of the, um, when it comes to civic engagement, all of the support tickets that have been um, requested or all of the internal support tickets or all of the internal um, conversations that have occurred that can allow us to accelerate the uh, creation of a knowledge base uh, for the organization. So that is another way to um, you know, dynamically be able to create content that can then be reviewed and decided whether it's, it's, uh, it's ready for prime time. So um, the, the big difference here, like I said, is that the algorithm constantly learns. There's the department specific models so every department has their own language and, and, and the way that this application is deployed is that every department is getting their own model uh, that is constantly becoming smarter about their, their particular um, business. Um, security, we can talk a lot about that. We have worked with you know, dozens of Fortune 500 companies and, and uh, our security uh, model is following best practices and compliant with uh, ensuring that any of the uh, confidential data remains confidential. Um, and uh, these, something to note here is that we build these conversations once and that deploys them to all the different channels. So we don't have to build a separate system for the mobile app versus the website versus Slack or, or anything like that. In terms of getting started, most people say, well, how do I get started? Is this something that requires tons of uh, pre-work to make happen? And the key is for the civic engagement part of it, where you're wanting to impart um, frequently asked questions and knowledge onto, um, onto citizens, it's really as fast as you can um, add content to the system and there's enough there that, that you feel comfortable deploying because from the technical side, it's very easy. One line of code goes to the website. Um, uh, there's not a significant deployment time in terms of getting this live with a new customer. So what we end up doing is we spend most of the time ensuring that we get the content ingested, get the model trained, and um, and make sure that it's tested you know, prior to, to going live. But this whole process for the civic engagement assistant, assuming it doesn't take months and months to gather content, is uh, just a few weeks. Um, and you would be live, you would be seeing um, what users are asking, and then you can constantly enhance from there. So you don't have to have everything already ready of anything anyone might ever ask because it can constantly grow in its knowledge over time and it can, it can direct the citizen to the appropriate department 
um, until it actually knows all the things that they they might be asking that department. So I think that's key. Um, and that is the end here. So I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Um, and so I'll leave it open here to see if anybody has questions. All right, thank you very much, Steve. So I hope everybody, we had a, we had a good crowd today. I hope you all got a feel for how powerful this can be. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of our time trying to access information when often we wish we could just do like in Star Trek and say, computer, tell me the fourth quarter earnings result and have that happen. So natural language processing, you know, powered by AI methods is giving us that kind of capability. And what Steve and IOLAP have done here is shown that they can deploy this for a variety of different teams or organizations or agencies or what have you. And using the same technology, but different training data, they can customize the models for, for different audiences. And one of the reasons this came up for Austin City Up is long time ago, we thought about, uh, wouldn't it be great if there was a civic agent? Because you, know, you can ask your home AI devices all kinds of questions about the weather and temperature and things like that. But for a lot of those civic issues, they don't know how to answer them on a local basis for the most part. And uh, this gives us that capability. And as you saw what Steve showed, it's incredibly easy to train it with correct answers. So, you know, you could have a boil water notice in the city of Austin and then suddenly, you know, almost immediately train these deployed AIs to give information about the boil water notice. Same with the pandemic, a, a zebra mussels infestation, a uh, Austin energy power grid issue, whatever. So let's see, we have some questions in the chat. Bill Kleinbecker says, what are the analysis features? And Ferris Bog says, do you collect sensor data from devices? Sure. Um, yeah, so as far as analysis features, I mean, there is a, there's a dashboard um, within the portal that allows you to get all sorts of metrics about user activity um, and, uh, understanding, you know, how many people are using it, what they're using it for. Um, there's all of the training methodology that allows you to cluster the content together and use natural language techniques to show that, you know, a lot of people are interacting in this, asking about a particular topic, but they're asking about it in 75 different ways. It will cluster that content together and give you, um, give you information. Uh, Bill, you say, so city departments could improve. Um, so in terms of, of that type of analysis, I mean, we're, we're collecting the feedback. So you're able to get information on, you know, whether users found the information helpful by the feedback they give with the thumbs up, thumbs down, as an example. There's also the ability to um, engage with the citizen in a short little survey where they don't even, you know, you're not saying, would you like to take a survey? You're just like, thanks for contacting us. What did you think about this experience? Or what did you, what do you, it sounds like you're interested in uh, the operations of the fire department. You know, what, what would you like to see improved uh, in, in the fire department for for Austin or whatever. And so the citizen can answer that and Responsum will track uh, those responses and the administrators will be able to see um, the types of feedback that they're getting uh, you know, through that sort of natural language dialogue. So it's, it, it works um, you know, 10 times better than just what people typically do would be to send out surveys to try to improve operations and they, Invariably, the survey rate is extremely low because people just don't take them. Um, whereas here, somebody's engaging you, talking about something topical, then you engage them back and they just feel like they're having a conversation. So you're able to collect information to help you improve through natural language dialogue. So that's another key way that this, that this can be used. Uh, hopefully that answered your question, Bill. Um, I love the ability to collect the data that people ask that maybe you don't have answers for, but now you at least know what they ask. So in no time, you know, practically you can 
get an answer, retrain the model, and now the, the model can always answer that question as well. I think that's a super powerful capability because you can't predict ahead of time what people are going to ask. But if we can respond rapidly to that, no more than one or two people will ask that before the model is now answering it. Right, right. So the other question was around sensor data from devices. So um, what Responsum does would be to be able to um, uh, allow you to ask questions about that data and connect to a system in order to, to um, understand what something might be something that might be happening real time. The actual collection of sensor data um, itself uh, and you know those sensors and understanding how all of that works. At IOLAP, we actually, um, as an example, we are uh, working with iRobot to, um, uh, their connected robot program is what allows them to proactively communicate issues that are occurring with the robots. And our team has developed uh, the backend system that allows it to collect that data and to then um, make informed decisions about what to do from there. So we have a ton of experience in that area um, in, in terms of responsum. Uh, the, uh, the ability to call an API and retrieve answers from that data that has been collected is completely possible. Right. I don't see any other questions. Is there anyone else? Uh, we, we can probably, if you stop sharing, Steve, we can probably give everybody a chance to, if they wish, bring their camera online again. Maybe some will. And we may have some more Maybe. questions. Any of our attendees have more questions? All right. Steve, thank you very much for doing this. Um, I know you're already working or talking to various folks in the city. Really want to thank Brad McCarty, who I see on this call, for his help in making sure that people understand at least what this technology is and how it might be useful. I, I am. 100% sold that the answer for the future is natural language interfaces. Um, you just don't know if people are going to be able to master the computer interfaces of various devices and consoles and keyboards and kiosks and everything else. But we all know how to either speak or type or both. So I'm super excited about this. Thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. Real Thanks, quickly, we have, uh, as a reminder, we have events coming up on April 28th and on May 12th. We hope you'll join us for those. And that is actually it. We wish you a great rest of your week. Please send us questions if you have any. Um, Steve put his contact information up there. But if you ever forget, just ask in the Austin Smart City Alliance Slack channel or send email to info at austinsmartcity.org or do we have an info for the Texas Smart Cities? Do we have an info at texassmartcities.org account? Jessica? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Say that one more time, Jay. Do we have an info at texassmartcities.org account? All right. Yeah. People can send emails with that one too. So yep, Jessica absolutely. will see it wherever it goes. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye.